Hey, I didn't see Stan over there. Yeah, caught me sitting down to my break. Been working, watching a guy dig a hole for the last three hours. You know, the road system we got here in the United States is pretty impressive. Sure, it could use a little TLC, but it's a far cry from what we started with. Ah, uh, heck, I got another four to five minutes left on this 15 minute break. Why don't you sit down and I'll tell you about the history of some of America's road projects. The American highway system began in 1811 with the construction of the National Road. It was the first roadway built and paid for by the federal government. It would stretch from Maryland to Illinois. But they didn't just start building the road out of untamed wilderness. The first leg of the National Road was known as the Cumberland Road because it ran from Cumberland, Maryland to Wheeling, West Virginia. Though at the time it was still part of Virginia. It followed a trail blazed by a Delaware Indian known as Chief Nima Collin while working for Thomas Crisap of the Ohio Company. The trail would become known as Nima Collin's Trail, but it was a path used by the local natives for centuries. Nima Collin's Trail would later be used by George Washington and frontiersman Christopher Gist in 1753. Washington was tasked with taking a government communique from the governor of Virginia to the French forces in the Ohio Territory and Gist guided him down Nima Collins Trail. The section that went from Wheeling through the Ohio Territory followed Zane's Trace. Ebenezer Zane was a veteran of the Revolution and eager to move west following the war. He made a living for himself in Wheeling with a small shop catering to the pioneers coming through headed to the Ohio Territory. Zane decided he wanted a slice of that land for himself. With Congress's blessing, he started out in 1794 with a company of five men, and they cut a path through Ohio. His trail would go through what is now modern-day Zanesville and Chillicothe, ending near Ripley, Ohio. His road became the way to travel, and the wilderness path he'd hewed was widened to accommodate wagons. Now the stage was set. Trails like Zane's Trace and Nima Collins Trail had served the pioneer population for a while, but then, Ohio became a state. And the newly admitted state was adamant about establishing roads to the east to connect itself with the rest of the United States. The first roadblock... <laughs> roadblock, that's a pun. The first roadblock in this plan was deciding who was going to foot the bill. Albert Gallatin, Jefferson's Secretary of the Treasury, was one of many who offered the possibility of Congress selling off public land and using a percentage of the proceeds to pay for the road. The idea caught on like wildfire. People started buying up land along the proposed route of this road. It was also Gallatin who referred to the project as the National Road in one of his letters. In 1806, Congress was presented with a bill and proposed route by Senator Uriah Tracy, who had drafted the bill with Ohio Senator Thomas Worthington. Starting in Cumberland, the road would run to Brownsville on the banks of the Monongahela, then on to Wheeling at the banks of the Ohio. The Senate passed the bill without incident. But it won't be Congress without a little bit of argument. Representatives in the House took umbrage with the proposed route. Virginia was upset the road bypassed Richmond. Likewise, Pennsylvania objected as the road barely passed through their state and ignored Philadelphia. Ohio and Kentucky both voted unanimously for the bill. In the end, the bill passed by a margin of 66 to 50. The National Road was moving forward and Gallatin's Treasury Department was placed in charge. Alright, so that's a lot of talk about politics, but why don't we move on to the fun stuff, construction. David Shriver Jr. had been appointed as the lead engineer, and construction began in earnest around 1811. Earnest may be an overstatement. From the beginning, the project was mired in problems. Shriver fought against the weather while working through the Allegheny Mountains, the spring thaw brought torrents of water down mountain creeks that washed away his marker posts. Contractors would constantly answer bids for work, only to see the site and declare it was too much work for too little profit. 
Loan contractor even took the complaint all the way to Gallatin himself. Finally, deals were worked out with the contractors and construction was in full swing. Many of the laborers hired by the contractors were newly arrived Irish immigrants. For their labor, they were paid $6 a month. That's around $140 a month in 2023. To feed the workers, they cooked up giant plates of biscuits, gallons of coffee, and dozens of pies. At night, they would erect tent cities. They needed to be mobile to follow the road. Here, they'd cook up pots of stew for dinner. They needed their vittles, for the work was hard and laborious. Axemen were the first line of workers, clearing the trees and brush. Behind them were workers with teams of oxen who graded the path for the road to follow, and diggers who made ditches on either side to carry away runoff water. Stone workers followed last, laying down the large foundation stones, a middle layer of crushed rock, and topping it off with smaller flat stones. It's a method of road construction that dates all the way back to ancient Rome. When bridges need to be built, they were shaped like a shallow S. Compared to a bridge that was a straight shot, these were easier to erect. Stone mile markers were placed down that gave travelers guidance. They often denoted the number of miles to Wheeling on one side and Cumberland on the other. During construction, the contractors occasionally butted heads with Shriver. They didn't understand the finer points of engineering like he did. Leading to time and manpower being spent repairing mistakes to the tune of $1,200. The National Road Project was bleeding money. Each year a new bill would come before Congress asking for more money for the National Road. While some debated the cost, the allure of a road to the west proved stronger. When the road finally reached Wheeling in 1818, the total sum of the project had cost the government around 13000 a mile. Adjusting for inflation, that'd be almost $315,000 a mile in 2023. But in the minds of the public, the road was a success. It didn't take them long to start using it for travel and commerce. Though, on the other side of the Ohio River, plans were already being made to extend the road. It took a few years, but in 1825, Congress authorized $150,000 for use to build the road across Ohio and Indiana, following Zane's Trace, and eventually ending up in Vandalia, Illinois. This time, Congress decided to put the War Department in charge of the construction. Under their command, they sent the Army Corps of Engineers to oversee the work. The Secretary of War, James Barber, insisted the road be built using the new construction method pioneered by England's John McAdam. Instead of using a large foundation stone, a macadamized road was built using three layers of busted stone to create a compacted driving surface. As the road moved out of the mountainous east coast towards the fields of the Ohio country, the army initially butted heads with a couple of farmers who were not interested in sacrificing their field for the road. But the army usually got its way. Around 1833, Congress began implementing a plan to turn over maintenance responsibilities for the National Road to the states that it ran through. The deal worked out was the federal government would apply the same macadam technique to the eastern leg of the road and repair any bridges. Then the states would assume responsibility. Captain Rich Delafield of the Corps of Engineers was appointed lead for the eastern repair work. Delafield's engineers built an 80-foot bridge across Dunlap's Creek. That holds the title of the first bridge in America with a cast iron support structure. And that bridge is still standing in Pennsylvania to this day. The National Road would stay popular through most of the 19th century, helping to populate those states west of the Alleghenies. Ohio was the third most populous state by 1840, but the popularity of the road quickly faded in the 1870s as the network of railroads now provided more convenient ways to travel. It wasn't until the 1920s that the National Road saw a resurgence of interest thanks to the proliferation of automobiles, with the National Road being adopted into Route 40, a highway that ran coast to coast. This resurgence of popularity didn't last. The construction of the interstate system in the 50s saw interest in highways like the National Road decline. No longer a road for commerce or commuters, it attracts people looking to take the scenic route. The National Road is no longer the journey, it's the destination.
Now, when it comes to the Army Corps of Engineers, the National Road may have been the first road project they worked on, but it wasn't the biggest. That would come over a century later in the 1940s with the Alcan Highway. For years, the U.S. government wanted to build a road to connect Alaska to the continental U.S., but the expense was too great, and there's no agreement between Canada and the U.S. on who would be responsible for covering it. But when Japan invaded the Aleutian Islands in 1942, a deal was struck between FDR and Canadian Prime Minister William Lyon Mackenzie King in February of that year to build the Alcan, or Alaskan, Highway. It fell to the Army Corps of Engineers to provide the manpower. While a national road started at one point and moved west, they would start the Alcan Highway at three different points. One team would start at Alaska and work south, another would start near Dawson Creek, British Columbia, and work north towards Alaska. Yeah, the Alcan Highway doesn't actually run all the way down to the northern United States. Dawson Creek was chosen as a southern terminus because it was already connected to a railroad line that ran down to the USA. The final team would start from Whitehorse, Yukon, the halfway point, and work on building bridges and clearing the land. But they weren't using just axes. They had dynamite. Now, as a military access road, comfort was not a high priority. Not much different from the National Road built 100 years ago, the Alcan Highway was built out of packed dirt and gravel. Soldiers would have to fight through Canadian mud, permafrost, and other elements during construction. Now, being this was 1942, the American military was still segregated. Working on this highway were the white regiments of the 18th, the 35th, the 340th, and the 341st, along with the black regiments of the 93rd, the 95th, the 97th, and the 388th Battalion. The black engineers made up 35% of the military workforce on this project. The Alcan Highway did mark the first time segregated units were allowed by the military to work side by side. But that didn't mean that everybody was on board with that. Commander of the American Forces in Alaska, Major General Simon Buckner, feared the African American soldiers would desert the army to make contact with Canada's native population. I'm sure that he was a real head of parties. And there were other ways that the deck was stacked against the Black Engineering Corps. Black officers were not allowed to be in command. White officers were placed in command of all units. But crews were spread out, so direct oversight was often impossible. Along with that, timely completion of this project was believed to be paramount to the war effort. This meant progress was more important than procedures. So military standards began to slacken up. Unfortunately, a lax attitude seemed to apply to their supply line. Like on the front lines of the European theater, armies live and die on supply lines. All the divisions involved were plagued by poor supplies. Their clothing and camping gear was ill-suited for the Canadian winters. Most of these units came from stations in Florida, Louisiana, and North Carolina. Heck, before this, the only snow they probably saw were the snow caps sold at the picture show. The black engineering units often drew the short straw being supplied with the worst of the available stock. Despite all these barriers, on October 25th of 1942, nine months after the project had started, the Alcan Highway was completed. The northern and southern crews met in Beaver Creek, Yukon, when the bulldozer of technician Refined Sims Jr. met Private Alfred Jalfuka's bulldozer. In total, the highway stretched across 1,620 miles of northern wilderness reaching from Dawson Creek, British Columbia to Big Delta, Alaska. Crews would stay to maintain the road throughout the war, but the lion's share of the work had been done. Unfortunately for 10 soldiers of the 97th, they were court-martialed for disobeying orders. This trial seems to be more to make an example than anything else. With Army protocols being lax during the project, the Army wanted to reinstill military discipline into the units. It should also be noted that the 97th was a black regiment, meaning this court-martial was also racially motivated. For the Alaskan Highway itself, in 1944, civilian crews would be put in charge of road maintenance on the Alaskan side. Canada would be handed responsibilities for their section of the road in 1946. In the following decades, sections of the road would be bulldozed or left as backcountry roads. Parts of the Alaskan section were folded into the U.S. interstate system. From the beginning, it was meant to be a military road. 
So when it transitioned to civilian life, no one really had a use for it anymore. Oh, hang on. Yeah, boss chief. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Another five hours. A new guy brought donuts. All right. Well, boss is on my case, so I reckon it's back to work for me. Next time you're cruising down the asphalt, keep an eye out for the history right under your tires. And heck, maybe I'll see you out there on the road. Hey, save the jelly field one for me.